So brief introduction for those who uh, aren't super familiar. My Vegas uh, is our sort of franchise, Play Studios is our company. We launched uh, in 2012 with My Vegas on Facebook, which was not the first, but one of the first uh, slot games on Facebook. And we're able to scale that uh, pretty aggressively for a year when we reoriented our entire set of resources to mobile uh, and launched My Vegas slots. Uh, following that, we uh, launched My Vegas Blackjack, Konami Slots, which is our exclusive publishing uh, deal with Konami, in which we publish their land-based slot titles into mobile. Um, our Tel Aviv studio uh, has launched Pop Slots in the last couple months, and it's doing uh, very well in its first uh, couple months of, uh, of scaling. And My Vegas Lucky Life is an app that my team in Hong Kong has developed and is in beta now, getting ready to exit beta later on this quarter. Um, so just uh, for additional background, Play Studios Asia is a subsidiary of the US company Play Studios Inc. Um, I think one of the core differentiating factors of the My Vegas franchise is our rewards platform. One thing I usually talk about is um, a lot of our team, in addition to folks that come from the games industry, uh, certain of our founders and certain of our senior team, myself included, are from the land-based business. And we think that has given us a bit of an advantage in creating, operating, and balancing our rewards platform and our rewards economy in the sense uh, that we understand how our resort and casino partners think about their inventory, how they think about the life cycle and value of their players, um, et cetera. So we launched with uh, all of the MGM properties on the Las Vegas Strip in our rewards inventory. So Mirage, MGM Grand, Bellagio, et cetera. And <clears throat> over the years, we've been able to add not only other casino partners, but other non-casino partners in the worlds of food and beverage and entertainment, like House of Blues, uh, cruises and travel, like Norwegian, and other sorts of things like that. But I think you can probably appreciate from the collection of, uh, of logos that are here is that uh, we try to keep our rewards inventory uh, focused on the experiential, and certainly focused on the resort um, lifestyle experiences. So you won't see a whole lot of uh, Starbucks gift cards uh, or that type of more commodity type uh, of reward in our program. We think that's a differentiating factor. So uh, in 2014, we started to pick our heads up from the US market where we're focused and think about what are the other uh, opportunities for us to grow, whether it's other verticals. And we started to look at other game genres, and my task was to look at other geographies. So um, I think most of you may know or appreciate that the Asia Pacific mobile games environment is massive in aggregate. So you've got two markets individually, China and Japan, that are more than one and a half times, or almost one and a half times rather, the size of the US market. Um, you've got Korea, which is about a, almost a third the size of the U.S. market. And then if you add up the rest of the Asia-Pacific markets, um, you get another 1.8 billion. Uh, and that's before you even get to Australia. So I guess the way we like to think about Asia-Pacific is that it's more of an arena uh, in that it's a collection of markets as opposed to a single market. And each of those markets has its own uh, issues. Now, let me just, for contrast, so consider that Asia Pacific, the reason I uh, cross these out is the original, uh, the original numbers were the business case upon which we underwrote Play Studios Asia. In the year that passed since we underwrote that business case, we found that China, China's mobile games revenue grew way faster and way more than was originally expected to, uh, to reach 10 billion, which is sort of mind-boggling because it was growing against an already giant scale. And Japan, I think, rather than growing that much, was sort of recalibrated and remeasured to be much bigger. But you can see in aggregate, 23.8 billion is a lot bigger than 6.5 billion. And you have uh, quite a few markets in that collection that are growing at a much, much faster rate than 15%, uh, which is what we have in North America. Now, Social Casino, on the other hand, if you look at uh, the, the last Super Data report, is 
much, much smaller in Asia Pacific, uh, not even a billion in 2016, um, supposedly, compared to you know, the more mature market of North America, which is uh, 1.7 billion. So I think you know, the question we asked ourselves and we continue to ask ourselves is, well, in our experience in land-based casinos, in online casino, in every other channel related to gambling-related uh, activities, it is sort of a truism and an inevitable fact that Asian players on a per capita basis end up being the most productive players in the ecosystem. Is social, therefore, the only one in which that's not the case? Uh, our conclusion is no. Our conclusion is that it is early and is complex to penetrate, but we think that uh, on a long-term basis, the collection of markets in Asia Pacific will prove to be uh, as, as productive and ultimately way more productive than the North American and other uh, markets. But the complexity associated with the collection of geographies in Asia is considerable. Um, along, you know, North America in particular is so nice in the sense that you have a very uniform and homogenous level of affluence. You have uh, almost total penetration of 3, 4, 5G, Wi-Fi, very high average device quality. Everyone's on Facebook. Um, but in uh, Asia Pacific, they, uh, you see that from the perspective of discovery, for example, everyone knows that in China there's over 200 independent uh, Android app stores. There's probably only four that matter, but you still got to deal with those guys. Um, iOS and Google Play across some of the other markets um, remain the dominant channels for discovery, but you also see independent channels such as MyCard uh, and other ones in Southeast Asian countries. From the perspective of payments, uh, credit card penetration is pretty low, particularly in Southeast Asia. So you see a lot of games uh, developers relying on prepaid cards or carrier billing. Um, and much less so on credit cards, which we can sort of rely on in, in North America. Social channels, uh, I think everyone knows, are super different. Facebook is not ubiquitous uh, or dominant. Um, and so that, that presents considerations for the different nuances that each of these platforms allow you to access their social graphs or not. Um, language, uh, Japanese and Korean, you know, correspond to two of the, of the three biggest markets. You can cover, and our strategy has been to cover, uh, a fair amount of markets with traditional Chinese. Can't cover China with traditional Chinese, but you can cover all of the ethnic Chinese in Taiwan, Hong Kong, Southeast Asia, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, we are super sensitive, given our uh, shareholder composition and history, to regulatory considerations, um, which, which do vary. Uh, not to dwell on this too much, but I think um, some of you may appreciate that in China there are not uh, specifically legislated laws against social casino. There are references to gambling, but the way uh, un unwelcome games of chance are defined is more in practice as opposed to in written law. So we've seen that um, Certain games of chance like Mahjong or Dodiju, which is uh, beat the landlord poker, or even Hold'em are fine. And certain genres that are just as chance-based but more associated with casinos like Baccarat or even slot games are ill-advised, uh, even though there may not be specific regulations naming those genres. Um, in the market of Japan, there's no regulation similar to some of the markets we deal with, but there's a very, very high barrier in terms of consumer preference uh, and genres not necessarily as familiar with slot machines as some of the other markets. Um, and the most aggressive regulatory environment I've ever seen for social casino is Korea, in which you must have a Korean company, you must obtain a license, and there are very, very aggressive uh, limitations and regulations to bet limits, loss limits, purchase limits, uh, et cetera. And you know, amongst the other markets, it's kind of a, it, it can be a mixed bag. A lot of them haven't uh, tackled or decided to tackle social or, or even online. Some of, a lot of these markets are relying on betting and gambling laws that were written in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and so there's a, a relatively open or unspoken uh, view as to social casino. 
So it's sort of amongst this, this environment that we, we have to select from and navigate. Oh, look at that. I think I was here to highlight some of the more specific ones. I think everyone knows about WeChat. The, the, the unhappy thing about WeChat is they develop their own games. So while you're, while you're busy trying to integrate with them, they're going to you know, market the game that you submitted to them. Um, as I mentioned, traditional Chinese can cover a lot of Asia, uh, but there are a couple markets where it's not super helpful. Uh, Indonesia is one that everyone's super interested in. Uh, Bahasa is not an easy language to localize in, but that's kind of what you got to be doing. Uh, and, I, and I mentioned the regulatory environment in Korea. Hmm. Wow. Hold on. Don't worry. There we go. Uh, I'm now going to read to you each of these numbers. <laughs> Here's the point I want to make here. In certain markets like China, uh, the top three grocers are Chinese games made by Chinese companies. Uh, in Japan, the top five grocers are Japanese games in Japanese made by Japanese companies. In Korea, top three games, Korean games made by Korean companies. To us, we interpret that as saying, this is a representation or, or an indication of the stage these markets are in. It's not easy to integrate with the platforms, the language, the culturalizations, et cetera, that these markets demand. So of course, the native companies that have decided to pivot into casino have done well there. Uh, in Australia, some friends uh, of all of ours have done well, Heart of Vegas, and of course, Slotomania House of Fun. Um, Taiwan, uh, traditional Chinese games made by largely Taiwanese companies. This uh, aspect of it, this is sort of everyone else predominantly Southeast Asia, and you see it's mostly dominated. The leaders in each of the casino categories in these markets are our friends, Western social casino companies. Um, so the, the sort of vectors for evolution as we go. The easiest one is channel. Um, if you were Slotomania or if you were House of Fun, the easiest thing to do is throw money at something and not have to, not culturalize it yet, not language uh, localize it yet, not change the genre yet, because you can just find out, spend a couple hundred grand in a month and find out if you get traction or if you don't. And in the early days, they have, and that's why some of those markets reflect their, their leadership. Um, you guys have probably seen a lot of different versions of this slide, but to summarize, the discovery and payment channels are a zoo. You really have to make a big commitment uh, to maximize your coverage. And that, and that means, I think, for all of us that are small to medium-sized developers, it means a huge investment in resources for integrations. Um, this is what I was mentioning before uh, in the sense that Western companies have, I wouldn't even say localized, but Western companies have seized the leadership positions in some of the South, Southeast Asian markets simply by being first to UA. It may not be speaking to everyone because it's not language localized, it may only be in English, maybe no difference in mechanics, progression, art, et cetera, but they're first there. And so in a, in a sense, they have may have grabbed uh, some of the more avid users in each of those markets. Uh, so that's, that's, what we that's what I would refer to as uh, the channel vector. The second vector is culturalization. So um, Zynga, is here's an example of, of simply changing the game uh, to include traditional Chinese. Um, not a whole lot of other culturalization or localization in the game, but you know certainly uh, they must be able to pick up another couple of points with this methodology. Um, and then I think another step further is um, our friends at uh, Fa Fa Fa, who've taken their existing land-based Asia-focused slot games and uh, package them in a, a meta and a UI that speaks to um, the Asian audience. And they've done super well with that. Um, so what we did on the left is the original My Vegas slots, and on the right is My Vegas Lucky Life. So our first kind of brush stroke in the last year has been to follow, I guess, the two other folks that I showed you, which is to quote unquote culturalize the game in terms of language and in terms of uh, theme and art style. But that's uh, really not as deep as you can go. 
but it's a way for us, as with our friends, to kind of move fast. Um, we also felt that we had to culturalize our rewards inventory. So we've spent a fair amount of time over the last two years gathering uh, resorts, partners, hotel partners, cruise partners, restaurant partners from Genting Highlands in Malaysia to Resorts World Manila in Philippines, MGM Macau, and including their food and beverage, their entertainment, their hotel offerings in our rewards platform. Uh, here's, a, I guess, a pretty subtle, when you look at it, visualization of how we've culturalized some of the symbols and themes in, uh, in Excalibur. Uh, and again, you know, we've taken some of our more successful titles in My Vegas and made, I think, somewhat subtle adjustments to them uh, to add to our, our Asia-facing app. So. I think our conclusion from all that was, from all that work was, that is really, really too light a step and too light a touch to gain the penetration that we're interested in. This is the reason, this is an example of the reason we decided to form a full stack standalone studio in Hong Kong. Um, we, we brought over a couple key creative people, a couple key um, product and engineering people, and then we hired uh, game design talent around them. So, for example, we uh, brought our game economy designer in from Tencent. We brought our technical artist lead from Activision in Shanghai. And the intent was always to build uh, games for Asian players by Asian game developers. So let me see if I can make this play. This is... Oh, there we go. It's a slot game, still a Western genre. However, everything from the math, the bonus, the symbols, the language, the style of celebrations, the sound design were specifically designed for an ethnic Chinese audience. Uh, this is a chart illustrating the coin-in of our various games. You can see the, the blue one is, uh, is Fortune Charm. So at least when it, when it comes to our very brief experience, a fully culturalized game, even from a uh, predominantly Western genre, has been much more effective in developing player interest and engagement. Uh, but we think that's really only still a half step, and there's a much deeper level to go, and that is uh, the genre of game itself. This is an example of Mobagi Slots, one of the top three uh, casino grocers in Japan. You can see that they've not only taken the look and feel from other Japanese games, super, high, super density, but also they've taken the experience of selecting a machine in a pachinko parlor as part of the meta experience. Um, many of you may know that Baccarat, as in terms of native genres, is by several orders of magnitude more popular than slots ever has been uh, in Asia. Uh, Ten Cent's Mahjong game, uh, a native genre built natively for domestic Chinese players. And then uh, chance-based genres that aren't necessarily from casinos. So everyone knows Diao Yu Dar and Fishing Joy, and Game of Dice, which certainly they're not casino games. You don't find them in a casino, but they are chance-based and they have economic characteristics that are similar to what we all uh, are interested in. Uh, the final dimension, I guess the, the, the fourth vector, is the evolution of the player. Um, the, in our experience, our brief experience, the Asia-Pacific players have a much deeper and aggressive appetite for content, game depth, progression. Um, happy and willing to monetize early and often if, uh, if the kind of content is there for them. Um, and, you know, choices, what I guess what I mean by that is, there's a lot of developers uh, making a lot of games, and so um, you really only have one opportunity to grab them, uh, and if you don't, they're on to the next game. 
Uh, and then finally, you know, it's early days, but we see continuous improvement in all of the kind of core infrastructure, whether it's coverage, Wi-Fi, and or device. That's it. Thanks. So one of the thing is that I'm trying to figure out it. If you take your uh, genre now of, of the game that is in Chinese and you put in regular slots there with the regular uh, American mm. stuff, will it work because they now recognize you more as something that they know, like you have now some kind of credibility and you can push other stuff or it's per slot, per game? Do you mean if we were to take our like Fortune Charms game and market it in... No, add to Fortune Charms game just a game that will come near it that will be in more American style. We'll Do you oh, have I like see. prestige now that they say, okay, we know this company, if they issue a new game, we'll go to them or it's not aiding at all? I don't think it's aiding at all. I'd, I'd like to, you know, we'd like to think that we have a, a very widely recognized franchise and, and certainly, you know, our audience in the U.S. is very avid and, and loyal to our games, but I, and we did start with a little bit of a tailwind in the sense that there are some organic users of My Vegas and the other My Vegas games based in Asia, so certainly we start with them, but I think in the larger kind of universe of players, our titles aren't, aren't very well known. When it comes to content, I mean, uh, the Asian market, as you showed, has actually uh, quite a few countries that are very different in preferences. How do you create content that will appeal to a Malaysian player, an Indonesian player, and, for example, a Chinese player under the same app? Is it possible at all? Um, I think, I don't, I don't think, um, I guess what we would say is, what we would think is, outside of the, there's the big three and there's sort of everyone else. That's sort of how we think about it. If you think of everyone else, it includes all of Southeast Asia, Taiwan and Hong Kong, generally speaking. It's very difficult to deeply penetrate into all of those at once because of, as, as you mentioned, there's language differences, there's cultural differences. One thing that we find very important is there's a strong asymmetry in familiarity with casinos. So for example, in Malaysia, they've had a casino, Genting Highlands, for 40 years. So the population in Malaysia is deeply familiar with casino games, not just Baccarat, slot games, etc. That's pretty meaningfully different than some of the other geos in Southeast Asia. Um, so I think our, our first approach to try to move fast, and I wouldn't say this is the ultimate solution to penetrate most deeply into all those markets, is to say, let's try to speak to a very broad audience in each of those markets with traditional Chinese and sort of taking a center line strategy. That's everywhere else. As far as the big three, each of those, each of China, Japan, and Korea are big enough, deep enough, complex enough, and sort of unique enough to warrant their own, obviously their own title, uh, if not their own kind of departure in terms of genre. It seems like in some of the payment um, environments you described, it could be tough to uh, to get really large LTV out of some players. Is there a higher conversion rate that sort of makes up for that? Um, so you're saying because of well, the because of some of the payment we said that prepay cards are common, that com credit cards are not, aren't always available, uh, and obviously you know a customer the, just from a a, a, uh, a currency basis in some of the countries on a on a dollar basis, you're not going to get you know a hundred dollar player that, that's it's a lot of money in some countries. So is there a higher conversion rate to pay that sort of makes up for that that lo higher LTV that you might experience in a Western country? Above a certain level, I'd say yes. Um, but uh, let, me, let me think about how to answer that. In, in the larger markets like Taiwan, Taiwan is a case study. So my card as a discovery and payments platform is as big, has as much market share as Google in Taiwan. Um, Taiwan is a medium sized market uh, and worthy, worthy of our attention. So we sort of made the investment there. As it turns out in Taiwan, they're quite experienced and sophisticated game players happy to pay. So in that specific example, I would say yes. In some of the more developing uh, areas, like Indonesia, uh, I think you know, it's, it's going to be a little more bumpy. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.